Okay, so we have a great turnout this morning. Um, I'm not surprised because this is a really important topic. Welcome to the last Grand Rounds of the year. My name is Alan Schroeder. I'm the chair of the Grand Rounds Committee. And this is, we're going into extra innings for this session uh, because we realize um, what an important topic uh, vaccination in adolescence is at this point. And, and we're building so many questions uh, from the community and from within the hospital uh, that um, we decided to put together this panel of amazing experts uh, that I'll introduce shortly. But first, uh, the, the standard stuff about logging in for your CME credit, you can see the text code there and the phone number to text too, and that will go into the chat. Um, as, as mentioned, this is the last grand round of the season. Uh, we will restart September 10th uh, when Perry Inder from Harvard will come and speak to us about neurodevelopmental outcomes and high-risk infants. So, um, and, and thank you, Serena. Uh, you can stop sharing the slides. I would like to introduce today's panel of speakers uh, who have been really gracious uh, in putting this together at such short notice. Uh, we have Liz um, Kapita, Shiraz Mascadia, and Grace Lee. Liz will go first, and she is an assistant clinical professor, pediatric cardiology. Uh, she did uh, residency and fellowship um, at Boston Children's, as well as an advanced fellowship in um, transplantation and heart failure, and is now part of our PAC team here, the heart failure team here, and really has been central to many of our efforts around coordinating uh, diagnosis and management uh, of myocarditis following the, the COVID vaccine, and she'll talk about that today. Uh, Shiraz um, is uh, one of our own, did residency training uh, around the time that I did back in the caveman era uh, and, and went and did a uh, cardiology fellowship at Baylor and then came back to us about 10 years ago uh, and has now um, really been central to our imaging uh, efforts around this. Is in our echo lab and, and has been coordinating um, the imaging and we'll talk about uh, both, both echo and, and MRI findings in his section of the talk today. And then finally, Grace Lee, who is a professor of pediatrics in uh, pediatric infectious disease. She's also our CMO for practice innovation at Lisa Packard Children's Hospital. Um, and most relevant to today, she's, she's a member of the U.S. Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices with the ACIP. Uh, she's a member of the COVID-19 Vaccines Work Group, um, and she's the chair of the COVID-19 Vaccine Safety Technical Subgroup. Uh, lots, of, lots of stuff that Grace is involved with uh, has been... Um, willing to come and speak at our, our COVID and children series uh, on multiple occasions and really has, has provided amazing insight into what is happening uh, at the national level and will address um, uh, some of the policy implications uh, for this. So Liz, take it away. Joining us today for this uh, top talk, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, COVID uh, vaccines and the associated myocarditis that we've been seeing. I'm gonna start by talking about the background and clinical presentation. So first we're gonna review myocarditis and then I'll highlight some of the known data on the cardiac involvement in COVID-19 infection and MISC. We'll review some of the available data on the COVID vaccine associated myocarditis. And then I'll introduce you to the protocol we've been working on developing on vac for uh, the vaccine associated myocarditis. So myocarditis is uh, inflammation of the myocardium that's often associated with cardiac dysfunction. It's quite rare with an annual incidence of one to two per 100,000. We do typically see a bimodal age distribution with increased incidence in infancy and adolescence, and there tends to be a higher prevalence in male. The most common etiology is viral, and the pathogenesis of myocarditis is direct viral invasion of the myocardium that leads to acute cell injury and necrosis and immune activation, followed by T cell infiltration. Presentations can vary widely from asymptomatic to decompensated heart failure and hemodynamic collapse requiring advanced cardiac supports. Uh, labs often show elevated inflammatory markers, um, including an elevated troponin and BNB, and um, can be, and treatment is typically supportive uh, with IVIG as well. Sorry about that. 
Um, the diagnosis uh, is typically made by cardiac biopsy, which is the gold standard for diagnosis. Um, there is often a low sensitivity though, due to the patchy infiltrates that are seen. The pathologic criteria are the Dallas criteria with having an inflammatory infiltrate of the myocardium with necrosis and degeneration of the adjacent myocytes that's not seen uh, in ischemic disease. And here you can see a picture of the histology of the myocarditis with the lymphocytic inflammatory infiltrates. Cardiac MRI has increasingly been used in the more recent era, as in addition to being able to detect myocardial injury, you can also detect edema and function. And the Lake, Lake Louise criteria are used to make diagnosis. Shiraz will mention more of this later in the talk. The, with COVID infection, uh, the pathophysiology involves both um, an immune response to the viral infection with lymphocyte and macrophase activation that can lead to a number of uh, changes, including that leads to thrombosis, endotheliitis, and a cytokine storm. But we also know that COVID viral infection can directly um, uh, and enter into the myocytes via the ACE2 receptors. And the, both the inflammatory response and the direct viral entry lead to myocyte injury. When you look at the pathologic features of COVID-19 um, uh, infection, this is an autopsy study of adult patients that were positive for SARS-CoV-2. And when you look at the findings in this uh, group of patients, um, there was uh, about 70% of them had an elevated troponin, 57% uh, had ECG changes, but there was only lymphocytic myocarditis in about 14% of these patients, whereas 86% of them had interstitial macrophage infiltration without myocyte injury. So this is looking a little bit different than what we would typically see in a lymphocytic myocarditis. Um, there are also findings of endocardial thrombosis and um, RV myocyte injury and pericarditis. So the findings of this paper were interesting in that they found this frequent myocardial in interstitial macrophage infiltration, but without myocyte injury and without the typical findings of lymphocytic myocarditis. When we look at multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children, uh, this is the New England Journal of Medicine paper. And I know we're all familiar with MISC at this point. When you think of the patients who are getting MISC, it's typically a bit more male at 62% in the New England Journal study with a median age of eight years, and the majority have been healthy. The cardiac involvement in these cases is about 80%. And interestingly, there is quite elevated troponins and BNPs that appear to be out of proportion to the degree of LV dysfunction, as the majority of cases have uh, normal LV, LV function in 62%, despite the fact that 50% of patients had an elevated troponin and 73% had an elevated BNP. Um, in April, we started hearing reports of myocarditis following COVID vaccination. The initial reports were out of Israel and the US military. And as more adolescents became vaccinated, there was growing cases seen by pediatric providers here in the US. And as we know, this began to become quite popular in the mainstream media. And so I know many of us have gotten questions about what's next and what we should do um, for these patients. Uh, there is only one uh, case report at this point of uh, myocarditis following vaccination in pediatrics, and that is this study um, that was published in pediatrics in June from Marshall et al. It's a case report of seven healthy adolescent males who presented with chest pain after the second dose of the Pfizer vaccine, and they were diagnosed with acute myocarditis. All were tested for SARS-CoV-2 by PCR and were negative, and six of the seven were negative for antibodies, suggesting that they did not have prior COVID infection. Five of the seven had fever, but none of these patients met criteria for MISC. All had an elevated troponin. The, they were all treated with NSAIDs, and four out of the seven were treated with IV and IG and steroids, as may be typical for classic myocarditis. All underwent cardiac MRI, which was notable for late gadolinium enhancement that was characteristic of myocarditis, and all res resolved their symptoms quite quickly. In working on uh, these findings around uh, myocarditis following vaccination, the CDC has developed uh, a working definition um, that will help frame our further conversation. So a clinical case of acute myocarditis is defined as the presence of one or more symptoms of chest pain and discomfort, shortness of breath and palpitations, abnormal testing, including an elevated troponin, ECG, 
echo um, or cardiac MRI and no other causes for the symptoms or findings. Whereas a confirmed case is presence of symptoms along with abnormal testing, including an elevated troponin and cardiac MRI or histopathologic or biopsy confirmation of myocarditis. When we look at uh, the data from VAERS, where they have been trying to track all of these cases, we can see that the vast majority of patients are presenting with chest pain and elevated cardiac enzymes. And there's also frequently abnormal EKGs with ST or T wave changes, along with um, much less frequent abnormal echocardiograms. When we've talked with other centers, reviewed our data, discussed these cases within the Bay Area and more broadly, there are very consistent findings of these cases across all centers. The classic presentation is a previously healthy male adolescent who's presenting two to five days or so after the second dose of the mRNA vaccine. And they tend to present with chest pain and an elevated troponin, often with um, occasional fevers. The ECG is often abnormal uh, with ST segment changes or T wave inversions and PR depression. Their echoes tend to be normal. There is occasional mild or low normal um, function. The cardiac MRI is consistent with myocarditis per the Lake Louise criteria. And Shiraz will talk more about this shortly. The treatment options have been quite varied across centers. Anti-inflammatories are used most commonly with NSAIDs and occasionally colchicine or Tordal, um, and occasionally steroids or IVIG are used. Some centers are treating these cases per their MISC protocols, although as I mentioned, these patients aren't actually meeting criteria for MISC. Uh, the troponins are typically followed and a repeat MRI is planned, although as this is a current situation, not many patients have had repeat MRIs yet. And there's been ongoing questions about whether these patients should be exercise restricted. As classically in myocarditis, we would exercise restrict a patient for six months following true myocarditis. The outcomes appear to be good. Per VAERS, 81% of discharge patients had full recovery of symptoms and that data is still being collected. Due to all of the questions about how to manage these patients and the ongoing concerns, along with the variability in practices, a group of us have worked together to try and develop a protocol for management of these patients. So this uh, should hopefully be a, a published soon uh, for everyone to review, um, but uh, this is what we have framed out for um, a protocol. So for an initial evaluation, we would recommend the evaluation of a patient with chest pain, shortness of breath or, breath or palpitations within about a week or 10 days of receiving a COVID-19 mRNA vaccine. This myocarditis uh, finding has been seen after both the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine. And as I mentioned, the vast majority of these patients have presented with chest pain and usually within five days. The initial diagnostic testing we would recommend would include a troponin, an NT-PRO uh, or a BNP, and CRP along with an EKG. If that evaluation is reassuring, chest pain can be treated with ibuprofen with close outpatient follow-up. But if that evaluation is abnormal or if the symptoms seem to be severe, further evaluation is warranted. And that could be done by an urgent referral to pediatric cardiology for a repeat evaluation, including an echo. And if there's concerns, again, we could think about telemetry and uh, observation uh, with an inpatient admission. And if the troponin is abnormal, we would recommend that all of these patients obtain a cardiac MRI. If the patient appears unwell, we would recommend a more urgent evaluation in the ED so that um, they could, you know, if there was any concern about unstable vital signs or rapidly evolving clinical findings. And the ED evaluation would include the above testing along with COVID testing and evaluation for any other etiologies of myocarditis, including a respiratory pathogen panel. If the studies and evaluation in an ER are, are normal, it would be reasonable to discharge the patient from the ER um, with close follow-up uh, and ibuprofen for symptom management. In terms of the patients to admit, admission uh, to acute care cardiology would be recommended for any patient with an elevated troponin, an abnormal EKG, or any evidence of decreased systolic function. Consideration for admission to the CVICU should be considered if there is significant dysrhythmia, respiratory distress, or moderate to severely decreased systolic function.
During the initial phase of management, we would recommend serial troponin monitoring, ongoing telemetry, and cardiac MRI. And if there is a concerning family history of sudden death or cardiomyopathy, consider a consult to cardiac genetics for consideration of genetic testing. Symptom management is uh, as needed and does not need to be standing with ibuprofen as the first line. And if there is significant LV dysfunction where the case is looking more like a classic lymphocytic myocarditis, we would consider the addition of steroids or IVIG per routine myocarditis management protocols. Discharge criteria would involve resolution or significant improvement in the symptoms and no arrhythmia for at least 24 hours. The troponin does not need to be normal, but should hopefully be downtrending before discharge. And if there is any concern for arrhythmia or an abnormal cardiac MRI or echo, we would re recommend placement of a Zeopatch or Holter monitor prior to discharge for monitoring of arrhythmias. In terms of the follow-up, for patients whose workup is negative, meaning they've had a negative troponin, a normal echo, and a negative cardiac MRI, we would recommend close follow-up with primary care with a repeat evaluation if their symptoms persist, but they would not require any ongoing cardiology follow-up and there would be no exercise restriction. For a clinical case, which I've defined as an elevated troponin, but a normal cardiac MRI and a normal echo, they could follow up with the primary care within the first few days and trend the troponin at least weekly until it normalizes. They should follow up with cardiology in a few weeks time with a repeat evaluation, but they would not require a repeat cardiac MRI unless there was new symptoms that changed the practitioner's concern. They should be exercise restricted until their troponin and echo normalizes and cleared by cardiology. We'll contrast that with a confirmed case, meaning an elevated troponin and an abnormal echo or cardiac MRI. These patients should again follow up closely with primary care and again trend their troponin until normal, um, but should have both close follow up with cardiology and plan for a repeat cardiac MRI along with exercise testing at three months time. These patients should be exercise restricted until at least the three month mark for their cardiology follow up pending normalization of labs, cardiac MRI and exercise test. With that, I'll turn things over to Shiraz uh, to discuss uh, uh, MRI in uh, these patients. Hold on, let me just stop sharing screen. Hi there, everybody. Thanks so much, Liz, uh, Dr. Profita, and thanks, uh, Dr. Schroeder, for the opportunity to talk to you guys today about uh, COVID-19 related uh, vaccine-related myocarditis um, and using cardiac MRI and the diagnostic criteria. I have no relationship to disclose. Gadolinium as a, con as a contrast agent is off-label in children. So today we'll talk about the referral criteria for a cardiac MRI to bite for myocarditis. We'll talk about the diagnostic criteria for myocarditis by cardiac MRI and the accuracy of cardiac MRI in the setting. And then we'll talk a bit about our post-COVID-19 um, vaccine-related experience. So who gets into the magnet? So again, this is in general for myocarditis. All cases start with laboratory evaluation, including an ECG and an echo. Um, Liz nicely talked about the um, indications for su in suspected myocarditis. Um, so again, those with elevated troponin, entitled BNP, um, new onset dysfunction or ectopic arrhythmia, ECG changes, um, and those with known myocarditis. So patients who have had a diagnosis, either clinical or confirmed, uh, by imaging and or biopsy um, to follow um, and track recovery. And this has been used in the past to clear for sports participation. Um, just as important as who should not get into the magnet. Uh, so we definitely don't want patients who, if are, who are clinically unstable to come down to all the way down to radiology and stick them into um, an enclosed space. So those with a high ventricular arrhythmia burden, those with intermittent heart block and rapidly changing clinical status. Um, High-grade arrhythmias do make it very difficult to gate, um, so it makes the cardiac MRI itself quite difficult. <clears throat> and in those with renal failure, we cannot give them gadolinium um, due to the risk for nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. Um, evaluation for myocarditis by cardiac MRI involves uh, fairly standard sequences um, that we use when assessing ventricular size and function and takes advantage of the ability of MRI to characterize tissue using very specific techniques that we'll talk about that evaluation does require the use of a gadolinium-containing contrast agent. So in, initially, in terms of systolic function, 
So obviously we'd want to assess the stock function of any patient referred for myocarditis evaluation. Um, patients who present with worse dysfunction are at higher risk for worse outcomes, not surprisingly. On the left, you can see the initial echocardiogram of such a patient who has severe LV dysfunction, particularly of the ventricular septum. This is the kind of patient who may be clinically unstable and not a great candidate for cardiac MRI. Once the same patient um, was stable enough to undergo a cardiac MRI, um, you can see that the systolic function actually improved quite dramatically. So this is a patient, again, just to remind everyone, this is um, acute fulminant myocarditis, typically viral in etiology. This is not COVID-19 vaccine-related myocarditis. There are some uh, major findings that we use to diagnose myocarditis. The first of these is the assessment for myocardial edema, which shows up as a hyperintense signal on T2 imaging. On the left, you can see that same patient from the prior slide, so those with that with um, a history of acute fulminant myocarditis. Despite the fact that the function had improved, there was still um, evidence of diffuse myocardial edema, which is highlighted by these red arrows. In the middle and the right panel are examples of cases who presented one to three days after receiving an mRNA COVID-19 vaccine. Again, you can see the T2 hyperintense areas, which is that white stripe, um, that are consistent with myocardial edema and highlighted by the red arrow. Upon administration of, the, of gadolinium, we perform a specific sequence to visualize areas of myocardium that are injured or less metabolically active with increased extracellular space. Myocarditis is only one of the many reasons that myocardium may display late gadolinium enhancement, and that pattern of enhancement in the clinical setting can help define whether we're looking at myocarditis or some other pathology. So it's important to note that myocarditis is just one um, cause of these findings. Um, on the left panel is again, that same patient with acute viral myocarditis. And you can see those areas of late gadolinium enhancement that corresponded to the T2 hyperintense signal. On the middle and on the right panel are cases that developed soon after receiving a COVID-19 vaccine. The enhancement seen in those cases, again, it's the same region that we saw in the T2 hyperintense signal, which suggests myocardial injury associated with myocardial edema. I will briefly mention that some centers use early enhancement to assess for hyperemia and capillary leak. These um, sequences are quite difficult to do, and we have not found them to be particularly helpful, uh, which is the case at most pediatric centers, so we don't use these routinely. Um, Liz, uh, Dr. Profita referred to the Lake Louise criteria. These were developed in 2009 um, when they were first def defined. And this meta-analysis found that when two of the three above findings were used to diagnose myocarditis, cardiac MRI was 80% accurate with 67% sensitivity and 91% specificity. So not necessarily ruling out myocarditis, but um, very helpful in ruling in the diagnosis. A more recent study in children by the um, Society of Cardiovascular Magnetic Residence Pediatric Subgroup reviewed 143 cases and found that cardiac MR had similar accuracy as in earlier studies, and that while the majority of centers performed late gadolinium and T2-weighted imaging, less than a third performed that early GAD enhancement imaging. And that's our practice here at PACID. Um, the clinical profile of these patients is shown here, and I want to highlight that these patients on the whole were fairly ill with a high incidence of ventricular dysfunction, mitral regurgitation, inotropic and ventilatory support. And just to remind everyone, these data are in patients with acute um, fulminant viral myocarditis. Um, as techniques have evolved, we, view, we as a field have started using newer techniques such as parametric mapping to quantify T1 and T2 relaxation times in an attempt to be, provide more objective diagnostic criteria. This is an example of a T1 map from that post-COVID-19 vaccine patient that we showed earlier. That one with the dense region of scar and edema and was noted that in that region, the calculated extracellular volume was quite high at 39%. If you look at the myocardium in general at globally, the calculated extracellular volume was fairly normal. So highlighting that there was that specific region of both edema and myocardial injury. So this is our myocarditis protocol, uh, which we um, should take just about one hour to complete. Um, again, we basically are performing uh, 
techniques to look at myocardial ventricular size and function. Uh, we're looking at myocardial edema. We're doing newer techniques to look at parametric mapping and provide more objective data. Um, at most of the time, we'll perform perfusion imaging to make sure that um, that um, there's an even distribution of my, uh, blood pool to the myocardium. Um, and uh, then we'll perform delayed getting an enhancement to look for scar fibrosis. So lastly, I did want to describe for you the cases we've seen in cardiac MRI to date. Uh, I do believe that the majority, if not all of the cases that we've seen here at Packard have had a cardiac MRI. I'm very confident that there are cases out in the community who have, um, that we have not seen. Um, as you can see, the nine we've had nine patients evaluated in cardiac MRI, six of whom were positive. Those who are positive by cardiac MRI almost universally had markedly elevated troponin levels as you would expect. Um, importantly, all patients presented with normal or low normal systolic function. And this was at presentation. This wasn't once they were stable enough to go a cardiac MRI and no patients had AV block or high-grade arrhythmias. Two patients throughout their hospital course did have non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. Um, and while this is early days, we can't draw significant conclusions from these six patients. This experience is similar to those small published reports that Dr. Perfita referred to earlier. We at uh, Packard are also contributing to an ongoing multi-center report from the pediatric section of the Society of Cardiovascular Magnetic Resonance Imaging. Uh, which will be published soon, which again mirrors these findings. Uh, by and large, even in patients with very obvious T2 hyperintensity and late gadolinium enhancement, systolic function is preserved um, and patients um, are doing quite well, again, in the short term, and these are small numbers. Uh, speaking of small numbers, I did want to um, just demonstrate the one case who's had a uh, follow-up cardiac MR. So this is the first patient that we um, saw after COVID-19 vaccine with myocarditis. Um, again, on the left panel are the T2 uh, hyperintense sequence and the late gadolinium enhancement at diagnosis. Um, and at five weeks later, um, these both have resolved. And with that, um, I want to thank, oops, with that, I want to thank um, um, uh, Alan and, uh, and the organizers for the opportunity to talk to you today, and I will turn things over to Dr. Grace Lee um, to talk about um, policy issues. Thanks so much for having me. Um, it's a pleasure as always, and I really appreciate um, the two prior presenters, uh, you know, for their deep expertise in this area and for their guidance in helping us manage these kids going forward. I have no financial disclosures. As Dr. Schroeder mentioned, I am a member of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. This is a snapshot of the vaccine safety surveillance systems in the US. Uh, he also mentioned that I chair the um, vaccine safety technical work group for COVID-19 vaccines. And so um, the three systems on the left, uh, VSAFE, VAERS, and CISA, uh, have really been the foundation for our early warning system within um, the US with regard to any safety signals um, that arise. Uh, in addition, there are large linked databases on the right where you can see that we rely on those specifically to do not only signal identification, but also signal evaluation uh, because those have populations in the denominator and it is a much more robust way for us to assess risk. This uh, slide here depicts BAST, which is that uh, vaccine safety work group that I chair uh, and the activities that have been ongoing. So I'll tell you that prior to the first vaccine being authorized in the US in December of 2020, we actually met 14 times to make sure that we had our system set up and that we would have processes in place for reviewing post-approval or post-authorization vaccine safety. Um, and the first vaccine was authorized for use on December 12th. The first dose in the US was given on December 14th. Um, and since that time, we have had 26 independent meetings to review vaccine safety data, as well as five joint meetings with our COVID-19 vaccine work group focused on safety. Um, you'll see on the top of this uh, timeline that there are these are the ACIP votes uh, following authorization by the FDA. So December 12th, we uh, recommended Pfizer for use in 16 and older. 
on December 19th, Moderna, February 28th was the Janssen vaccine, and then May 12th was the Pfizer vaccine for um, teens 12 to 15 years of age. And on the bottom, what you'll see here is a timing of the availability of information. So these are vast assessments that we have presented publicly in open ACIP meetings or via the website, uh, depending on when, what those cadence of those meetings are. Um, and immediately after Pfizer and Moderna were approved for use, you know, we did note anaphylaxis following mRNA vaccines and our safety teams did really in-depth reviews on anaphylaxis, which we updated again at a March 1st meeting, as well as providing additional information on pregnancy vaccine safety. And I should mention that we also have a, a group of pregnancy experts that come together to meet with us um, uh, the vast group specifically to review the pregnancy safety data. Um, on April 14th, actually, I'll, I'll tell you, on April 13th, the um, pause was put into place by CDC and FDA for the Janssen vaccine pending our meeting on April 14th, where we discussed six cases of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis following Janssen, followed by TTS updates um, in April and May. And then in May, on May uh, 12th, or sorry, May 17th, I can't see the slides anymore, uh, we started to um, uh, uh, share information and updates about myocarditis. Initially that it was notable, uh, but without an elevated risk. And then subsequent to that, noting that there seemed to be uh, differences in the rates of myocarditis following vaccination. Uh, and we had the most recent update on June 23rd at the mm -hmm. open ACIP meeting. Um, the vast discussed um, our interpretation of the data. So uh, we recognized that the risk of myocarditis or pericarditis following vac uh, mRNA vaccination, and I will tell you that we put in uh, myocarditis and pericarditis together in many of the descriptions, partly because of the way the searches go within VAERS and VSD, but the vast majority of these cases are clinically presenting as myocarditis following mRNA vaccination in adolescents and young adults aged 12 to 39 years, um, and it's notably higher after dose two in males and within one week of vaccination. So this um, table down here shows the um, case rates per million doses of mRNA vaccines in the vaccine safety data link and in VAERS. Uh, when we pool the data together, you can see that um, amongst chart confirmed cases in the vaccine safety data link, the rate um, across uh, genders and across that broad age group is about 12.6 per million doses compared to 4.4 following dose one um, uh, mRNA vaccine doses. Um, but what is notable here is that in males, uh, and again, I'll just uh, note the limitations are that these data are emerging. So some of this are crude rates based on ICD-10 codes in VSD or crude rates and not the fully adjudicated rates in VAERS, but um, wanted to make sure we provided people with a sense of the risk as the investigation continues on. Um, that in males, it's approximately 32 cases per million second dose mRNA vaccines uh, compared to 1.9 cases per million first dose vaccines in females. So, uh, uh, and this again gives the range uh, across the various age groups. Oh, the other thing I'll just note is that, you know, we uh, uh, discussed at the meeting that the data available to date really do suggest a likely association of myocarditis with mRNA vaccination in adolescents and young adults. Uh, so on, on the uh, burden side of the equation, you know, it's really important for us to place these findings in context. Uh, the CDC presented this information, reviewing the data from the last few months, so between April and June, on rates of COVID-19 infection per 100,000 population by age group and sex. And you'll, you can see here now that um, adolescents and young adults are um, having the highest rates of COVID-19 infection. Um, and since the beginning of the pandemic, at least 7.7 .7 million COVID-19 cases have been reported among persons aged 12 to 29 years. And as a reminder, these are now vaccine preventable cases. Uh, so it's important to keep that in mind. I also um, pulled this, um, and what I really like about this is it actually shows you um, the case rates per 100,000 population in the gray, and in the blue, it shows you the percent of people receiving at least one dose of vaccine, and then on the um, x-axis, you can see that there is um, time. So uh, starting with the oldest age group, 75 and older, you can see they had the highest case rate until we started vaccinating and our vaccination rates became fairly high. 
you'll see that sort of same um, change in the or crossing of the curves uh, as you get, as you go younger and younger, uh, which again is really helpful. And you can see here that for the younger adults, uh, although the peak did happen December January, we continue to have cases of infection until we re uh, reach reasonably high uh, population level vaccination rates. Um, and so. Uh, to me, uh, my interpretation of this is vaccination really does make a difference and really is protective. And these are, again, cases that are preventable. Again, my CDC colleagues actually uh, in, at, at our in request really wanted to understand the benefit risk balance of uh, vaccination in the context of this new finding of myocarditis uh, following second dose vaccines. Uh, what they did was they situated in the current context, not as if we were in December, but as we are today, how many cases uh, the vaccination program could prevent. And they broke it down by age and gender. So you can see here on the left, females, and on the right, males, 12 to 17 years of age. I'll just go down on the um, left here. So 8,500 COVID-19 cases prevented, 183 hospitalizations prevented, 38 ICU admissions prevented, one death prevented, um, and eight to 10 myocarditis cases that might occur after second dose uh, vaccination with an mRNA vaccine, uh, which is really the only vac vaccine currently available for 12 to 15 year olds right now. Um, and then for males, you can see the benefit risk balance is um, different. It's 5,700 cases prevented, 215 hospitalizations prevented, 71 ICU admissions and two deaths prevented, and uh, approximately 56 to 69 cases of myocarditis following vaccination would be predicted to happen. Um, as you go older in age, and this, uh, they continued on all the way up to age 39, I believe, but I only showed this next one just to again reflect that the burden of COVID is, continues to be substantial. And uh, continuing vaccination would mean we could prevent 14,000 cases in females, uh, 18 to 24, and 12,000 cases in males, 18 to 24, uh, with associated hospitalizations, ICU admissions, and deaths. Um, and here are the number of uh, cases that would be anticipated based on risk estimates from the June 23rd meeting. So, um, and, and again, this is you know, a challenging question in that uh, where we are in the pandemic is very different than where we were in December and January. Um, so it's important for us to ensure that we're monitoring and assessing the benefit risk balance in a very dynamic way. So while COVID-19 hospitalizations are down in the US overall, um, what you'll see here is that certain areas of the country are now starting to see an uptick. And um, Missouri is an example here where you can see that um, they are increasing in the number of hospitalizations that are occurring secondary to COVID-19 infection. I'll also emphasize, and these numbers have been um, shared broadly in national news, but really like 99% of individuals are um, unvaccinated individuals amongst those who are hospitalized. Uh, and this came through on a listserv um, that I thought was actually really informative. And this came through about a week ago that um, in Southwest Missouri, they're inundated with very sick and younger Delta variant patients. So speaking to the new variant that everyone has been worried about with regard to increased transmissibility and um, continued impact on our communities and our healthcare delivery systems. There were approximately 100 inpatients and 99 were unvaccinated. Um, and the message was that if your regional vaccination rate is not high, be ready to stand up your surge plans again. I have to say, I feel very fortunate living in the Bay Area and that we have had amongst um, like the highest vaccination rates uh, in the country. Uh, in Santa Clara County alone, uh, we're over 80, almost 82% have received a, one dose of a vaccine and 75% of those 12 years and older. So this includes teens are fully vaccinated in Santa Clara County. So I do feel like, um, you know, we anticipate not seeing what other areas of the country are seeing where vaccination rates are below 25% overall. Um, I wanted to bring this back to the forefront because it's, um, we talked about it a lot uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, how disparities uh, and the inequities associated with COVID-19 infection were really uh, uh, born by uh, uh, some communities more than others, and particularly those with high social vulnerability index. Um, and we continue to see disparities in vaccination rates um, by race ethnicity. Although over time we have done better in that it looks like at least some of the gap is narrowing uh, between here um, uh, white and Hispanic populations, you can still see that overall our rates of vaccination uh, continue um, 
uh, to be lower in uh, black populations and Hispanic populations compared to white and Asian. Um, so why that's important is that if we are seeing new variants come through that are predominantly impacting un under vaccinated communities and unvaccinated individuals, um, we will again continue to see the disparities that happened previously and they will continue to widen the gap over time. So it uh, really behooves us to continue our efforts to ensure that we are engaging key community leaders and partners in our efforts to vaccinate and that we're not um, uh, you know, becoming complacent that even though our vaccination rates are better than they were a few months ago, that we still have a lot of work to do. So the key points that I wanted to get across, and then I'll uh, open it up and wanted to actually ask questions back uh, to the group so that I could hear feedback. Uh, but you know, for me at an individual level, we cannot predict which individuals will have poor outcomes following COVID-19 infection. Um, and this includes children and young adults. So um, MISC, PASC, which is uh, post-acute sequelae of COVID infection, previously known as long-haul COVID, hospitalizations and deaths. And again, these are all potentially vaccine preventable. And you know, I truly believe that every um, death in this country that occurs uh, in unvaccinated individuals to me is something that we can do something about. Um, vaccination is extremely effective for individual protection from severe disease. So nearly all the deaths are preventable. Um, there, you know, it is, uh, also extremely and highly effective against hospitalization um, and uh, effective against um, infection, um, symptomatic infection and asymptomatic infection. Um, although not 100%, uh, we are still protecting not only ourselves, but those around us. From a community perspective, we can predict that communities with the lowest vaccination rates, uh, which is a known um, you know, uh, piece of information, and dense social contact matrices, which are difficult to define how people interact with each other, will continue to have the highest rates of transmission. There are some proxy measures such as household density and community crowding, um, but they don't um, always explain everything because I think we don't always know how people interact with each other and particularly with reopening. Um, vaccination can also reduce the risk of transmission in families and communities, as I mentioned, and you know, we cannot rely on the herd alone for protection of vulnerable individuals. Uh, those who can't get vaccine, as well as those who may not respond to vaccine optimally, such as immunocompromised individuals. And then disparities. So persistent disparities in vaccination rates uh, will result in continued disparities in COVID-19 infections, hospitalizations, deaths, and economic recovery. Um, so uh, my, my questions I'm posing to myself and to the group here are, you know, is precision public health possible? Um, Real-time public health decision-making about vaccines is challenging I think it's possible. We have had 16 emergency ACIP public open meetings, as well as three routine ACIP meetings over the past year, um, since June of 2020. Um, and in addition, we've had uh, numerous work group meetings that uh, are feeding into those open ACIP meetings. And although we've answered a lot of questions, we know that there are many questions that remain about individual benefit risk balance. So there's every week emerging data and emerging publications with new information. We're seeing emerging variants coming across space and time and hitting different communities differently at different time points. Uh, variability in vaccination rates and then variability in adherence to other risk prevention strategies. Um, and I liken this to sort of as a clinician thinking about clinical pathways. So ACIP can make recommendations about vaccine use for the US population. And we are doing our best to manage all the questions that are coming in but many of the questions that are coming in are based on dynamic data and uh, trying to manage, it's akin to managing on pathway versus off pathway patients. So we might be able to capture, you know, 80% of the population with a clinical pathway, but there are many patients who don't meet pathway criteria and we still need to figure out how to manage and take care of those patients. And similarly for the US vaccination program, those same kinds of questions come up. Um, so I end actually with three questions for consideration that I'm struggling with. Um, so first is, you know, what level of scientific evidence is needed for robust decision making? I have my own opinions about this, about what ACIP needs to do uh, at a national level. But, you know, again, at the state level and at a local level and at a very individual patient clinician level, um, that level of scientific evidence may differ. How to resolve questions when data are sparse and clinical and public health opinions differ um, on interpretations of the data. And then how can, most importantly, how can we best support patients and providers in decision-making and ensure that we maintain trust in the overall US vaccination program? And these are the three questions that have been keeping me up at night in the past month. 
Um, so with that, I'll actually uh, uh, hand it back over to Dr. Schroeder and um, you know, would love to you know, discuss any of these questions going forward. Wow, well, you guys, you guys are just amazing because those were um, incredible presentations, very informative, very uh, concise, um, and I learned a ton. So thank you so much. We have um, an amazing amount of questions, uh, some of which have been answered already uh, in the Q&A function under the answered tab, um, but many more uh, both in the, in the chat and the Q&A that I, I, I would like to try to get to all of them. Um, and uh, we may go a little bit over just as a, as, as a warning. But the first, um, Grace, I think mostly will go to you and I'm gonna try to consolidate probably four or five questions, all asking about pathophysiology, um, which of course is, is sort of an, an unknown, I think at this point, and, and many are trying to study it in, in, including folks here at Stanford, but you know, people, people bringing up um, that it's happening a couple of days after the second vaccine, people bringing up that it seems to be all males. Um, do we know anything yet? Are we convinced that it's the second vaccine? Someone said, could it not just be a delayed effect of the first? It seems to be so consistent in the timing after the second that I suspect that's the answer to that. But what, what do we know at this point? And obviously, if, if Liz or Shiraz have anything to add to that, please feel free. And now I'm very happy to defer to Liz and Shiraz on these questions, um, but I'll just answer with sort of um, what I know and what, you know, what I can um, share. Right, so we've gotten this question in particular about, you know, why so tight in timeline right after dose two? Um, and it's really uh, hard for me to be able to answer that question. This is clearly not our typical post-viral myocarditis type of timeline, where it usually is, you know, a couple of weeks after the infection that we're starting to see an antibody response. This is, uh, seems more in line with shortly after we anticipate local and systemic reactogenicity. And so I think people have postulated, you know, different mechanisms potentially. And I think Liz, um, you know, got to some of that in her um, slides. Uh, and I uh, very much, um, would emphasize that investigation is underway, and I hope we will have a clear answers about the mechanism of action soon. To answer the question about two doses versus one, um, we have gotten this question before, and um, I will just uh, um, share that most kids actually have been getting vaccinated sort of within that 21 day interval. So we don't have a ton of variability in terms of some people getting vaccinated eight weeks later versus three weeks. So it tends to be three to four weeks after vaccination. So um, it is hard to know. However, I will say that after the dose one um, vaccine doses where we have seen the minority of cases, it again happens within that very short interval, which makes me think it's something related to um, recent vaccine exposure as opposed to a delayed effect of the first dose. But you know, again, we'll learn more over time and other countries have different vaccine schedules. So if we see differences in the way they present, we'll have more information about that soon. So, so yeah. sticking on, on the, oh, sorry. The, the well, I was just gonna say, yeah. I, was, I agree with Grace. I think that this is like, it is so early on right after the vaccine. This doesn't feel to me like a lymphocytic myocarditis. No one has biopsied these patients as far as I know, but we don't think that this is acting like a lymphocytic myocarditis where there's this, this T cell infiltration of, the, of myocardium. It really seems like more an inflammatory response that comes on very quickly and then turns off very quickly. And so it's unlike other disease processes. And I sort of think of it as like myocarditis myocarditis asterisks. Like, I don't think it's the same disease process. There's a lot of questions in the chat around like, what's the incidence of like COVID infection myocarditis versus COVID vaccine myocarditis. And the problem is there's a lot of overlap. I kind of mentioned this in the um, diagnosis of COVID associated myocarditis and MISC in terms of what was initially reported. So it's really hard to pull that out. So I don't know of any good data on what that actual incidence is. But as I mentioned in the one pathology, study that I am aware of, you know, this isn't, you know, there's only three cases in that case series uh, that had lymphocytic infiltration of the myocardium. And for the most part, um, that wasn't what was seen. So this seems to be a different process, but because it meets MRI criteria for myocarditis, that's kind of our best estimate. So it's more of like an inflammatory myocarditis. That's a different process. Yeah, I would agree. I, I would just also mention uh, quickly that you know, the presentation that we've seen, few cases that we've seen and those nationally appear to be um, self-resolved, presenting with normal or low normal systolic function, troponins that are high out of proportion to how the kid looks. Um, and so all of those things are very different from acute 
fulminant viral myocarditis. So although it is myocarditis, it's inflammation of the heart muscle, um, you know, the presentation and course appears quite different. That's interesting and, and helpful to, to distinguish it that way. The, um, I, I think sort of building on the, the one versus two dose question, Grace, that, that has been proposed by some, given that we get uh, reasonable efficacy uh, after the first dose, um, might it not be worth considering just sticking to one dose or delaying the second dose that's been uh, brought up in many circles? And then another question that came in on the chat was, what about using J&J &J for adolescent males since the, the issues around the J&J &J vaccine really were, were not were, were, were older patients? Um, so what are your thoughts on, on those potential yeah, alternatives? Thank you. I mean, so like, you know, I have to say, I really appreciate first, our, I, I will say that our clinical colleagues for the myocarditis have really been at the forefront in detecting safety signals. And our clinical colleagues continue to challenge me with these questions that I don't have a good answer for. And that's, you know, again, what keeps me up at night is that I recognize that there is this need for additional information. Um, ACIP really uses a robust process for decision making called the evidence to recommendations framework, where we do need data and evidence to drive or support the decisions that we make for the country. Um, with this question around um, don't give uh, dose two, well, I, I will say that my interpretation of the data, it has been that two doses are necessary for full protection. I am not convinced a single dose is enough. I think the question perhaps uh, relates to what you're getting at, which is um, dosing in the younger kids. And what I, I am hopeful that we will learn as we um, hear about data from the trials from the five to 11 year olds and then the two to five year olds is understanding dosing um, immunogenicity and reactogenicity and how those relate to each other, because I think that'll help better inform um, what's going on in the adolescent population. We do know that adolescents have a robust immune response and actually uh, fairly robust, at least in the data that we've seen for the 12 to 15 year olds compared to the young adults, um, higher immunogenicity than um, what we saw in the uh, adult trial. So um, how much is enough? And uh, can we balance that to ensure safety? I think that is always our goal, but until we have data to uh, demonstrate that, it becomes hard to make a national recommendation change without sufficient data that we're gonna actually preserve efficacy and effectiveness, particularly I think as these uh, variants come through that are far more transmissible. So um, that's part one. And then part two about spacing, you know, we have also got this question. Uh, and I will say that um, again, uh, if we can find evidence to support that the efficacy is not impaired, that the delay doesn't cause more infections in the interim and that it actually improves safety. I'm not actually sure what it'll do if it really is related to reactogenicity. Um, then all of that, of course, would inform decision making. I'll just point back to the challenge that we had, um, and I actually am feeling really good about this now, but it was really hard for me when we had supply chain issues and everybody asked us, why not just give one dose and defer the second dose and get more people a single dose of vaccine? And actually, now that we're seeing the data on effectiveness, if we tried to stick with the data, it was super hard because I, um, I you know, I'm super, um, I always worry about disparities and access. And so that was a really hard decision to stick by. But in retrospect, I think it was the right one. And we based it on having the data that we knew about to drive the decision making. So I know people will disagree. Um, and again, if we can see the data, happy to change decisions. That is not, uh, not the issue at all. It's really about having the data. Uh, Liz or Shiraz, anything you want to add to that? I wish we knew what the answer was. You know, we're getting a lot of questions about this. You know, I see a lot of patients um, in the hospital and, you know, everyone's asking us, should they still give the vaccine? You know, we're still recommending it at this point until the CDC, you know, we're trying to go along with what the CDC guidance is at this point. So we're still recommending vaccination and I'm guessing, you know, there'll be more to come. I do think, and there's a lot of questions about boosters and things like that. I mean, I think all of us would say if you've had vaccine associated myocarditis that you should not get a repeat uh, dose or booster, um, but, um, or if it was after the first dose, but as, I've, as we've mentioned, most of this is after the second dose. Um, I think that we'll learn more over time. Um, and I think, you know, just trying to follow the CDC guidance instead of changing practice. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I agree fully. The only thing I would say is just, you know, as a clinician, seeing patients who have had MISC and with particularly se severe cases of COVID, um, in addition to particularly severe cases of COVID, and then seeing patients who have had COVID-19 related myocarditis, uh, 
you know, as a parent, as a pediatrician, as a cardiologist, I would much rather have a patient with COVID-19 related, vaccine related myocarditis as opposed to the prior. Uh, on that note, uh, Liz, I mean, you, re you reviewed, I think, you know, the, the, the pediatric case series and what we know. What, to, to our knowledge at this point, what have been sort of the worst outcomes of the COVID uh, vaccine associated myocarditis? Or, I know there has not been, I mean, and maybe Grace, you guys discussed that, mm -hmm. but it seems as if the vast majority uh, get better and go home, but have there been severe cases? Yeah, in terms of our cases here, there was a few that got admitted to our cardiac ICU, at least for part of the time, and that was for monitoring of arrhythmia, and it was for non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. Only one of our patients has been started on Coreg, but again, that patient also had a, he's the one case that actually had a family history of sudden cardiac death, which um, may be unrelated, and so is sort of, be, he's being evaluated by genetics, so there's a bit of a different story for that one. So the remainder of our cases um, have not had, not needed any cardiac medication, no ongoing um, symptoms, really. I've seen a couple of these kids in clinic so far, and the most of them are feeling fine and doing great. And we have one of the patients who's had a repeat cardiac MRI at six weeks, and that was normal. Um, so it seems like this is all short-lived. And as I mentioned in the pediatrics paper um, and the VARES data, all these patients have for the vast majority done well. I have heard of one report, um, and Grace knows of this one too, at UCSF of maybe a patient who was more unwell where they thought it looked like acute coronary syndrome, but I don't know enough of the details of that to really speak to that. So there may be a few cases that are a little different, but when I hear through all of my colleagues across the country, it's all this exact same story. These kids who come in, have chest pain, high, high, high troponins, and then are fine a few days later. Yeah, and I, you know, I think um, what's unusual. So right now, again, I think we we absolutely 100% want long-term follow-up. So again, appreciate our cardiology colleagues for their willingness to continue to follow these patients and give us better information on what the course and outcomes are. I would also just say that um, you know what we're uh, remember that most of this is coming through passive reporting mechanisms. So the vast majority appear hospitalized, but there are patients who. Um, have gotten admitted and gotten discharged within a day, mostly because their numbers look um, off, but not because they are clinically unstable in any way. So I think that's important to remember. The other is, is that I think some of these patients haven't even come into the hospital. They're noted to have it. They're confirmed with myocarditis, but they're not sick enough to even admit. Um, so again, to um, Shiraz's point about the, the there is a, this is very distinct and different um, than the myocarditis that we're used to. And so, we have to understand it better. We wanna make sure that um, if it is something that is transient uh, with quick resolution, um, that we understand its long-term con uh, uh, consequences and outcomes uh, as a really important part of the benefit risk balance and the decision-making overall. I see that there's a question about immune deficiency. Um, I can just say in transplant patients, we have not seen any issues with the vaccine. Um, you know, we're obviously studying, you know, there's an infectious disease study ongoing looking at solid organ transplants response to the COVID vaccines, but I have not heard of any cases of children having immunodeficiency or having been cancer survivors or anything. I mean, these are all been cases of patients who were previously healthy as far as I've heard. Yes, as far as I've heard nationally, there have been no deaths from COVID-19 vaccine related myocarditis. That, yeah, that's helpful. I, you know, various stories circulate on social media, but you, you never know um, how to interpret those, this is, which makes it also challenging. Um, I, you know, I, maybe just for the, for the sake of folks that have to log off at nine, uh, maybe a quick one-liner from, from each of you. There, there was a, a question in the chat that says, given what you have presented today, what is your take home recommendation for endorsing vaccination to the middle school or high school community? Um, what I say, because I see a lot of patients and talk about this a lot, is that it's still, it's a rare finding. COVID infection is still a thing and I still worry about it. So I still strongly recommend vaccination and all of my patients, but I recommend that they recognize the signs to be watching for. So if they were to develop chest pain or have any concerning symptoms after the vaccine to seek care so that I alert them to the known data. I don't think that this is the same thing as lymphocytic myocarditis. I think it's a transient inflammatory response. And my hope is that there won't be any longstanding uh, effects, but that we'll have to see in time.
Yeah, I agree fully. I have nothing additional really to add to that, Liz. I, I agree 100%. I still fully endorse and um, recommend vaccinations for, you know, my kids when they're old enough, my nieces and um, nephews and my, uh, and my patients. Yeah, 100% agree. I mean, I think given what we know today and where we are in the pandemic and what we have available in terms of tools of prevention, it's still important to remember that there are COVID-19 deaths and there are COVID-19 deaths in pediatric patients. And I just think about um, if it is a preventable death, uh, the opportunity for us to um, have this tool to um, you know, prevent an unnecessary death is huge. Um, I will also just mention that um, you know, I really endorse Liz's point about it is really important that we share this information transparently and have these conversations with parents and families. Um, I can't emphasize that enough. I think people assume that with vaccines is just you get it or you don't, and there's no conversation about it, but everything should be a conversation. Um, we have to make people feel comfortable with what we know and what we don't know, and really help people think through the benefit risk balance, uh, not only for the population, but for themselves as individuals and as parents, you know, working with their kids to make decisions that are good for their health. Um, and I think that, you know, given all the information, you know, my hope is that people will feel really good about vaccination and the opportunity to stay healthy. We're also about to reopen and or we have reopened in the summer, but schools are going to reopen fully this fall. So I, you know, I anticipate that with the variants hitting areas at different times, it'll continue to be an issue. And then the last thing I'll just say, and I tell this to everybody, I have a um, team who is in the 12 to 15 age range who, as this is all unfolding and recognizing all the uncertainty, um, I still felt like getting vaccinated was a really important thing for us and our family to uh, protect my team, but also um, to protect those around us. So I give that as my personal example that I, you know, I wouldn't do this if I didn't think it was worth it. <laughs> I think that's such an important thing to emphasize that, that I, I'm not terribly worried about my child getting really sick from COVID, but I, I really don't want them to transmit it to another kid who then brings it home to their parent or their grandparent who then gets really, really sick. Um, and that, that's a really important part of this conversation is that you're not just preventing your child from getting sick, you're preventing them from transmitting to someone else. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna um, just take a few small questions at this point, or quick questions, I should say, no, no questions are small, um, and hope we can answer those. And maybe we'll go on for a couple more minutes. Obviously, if people have to log off, um, have at it. But uh, Dan Bernstein asks, any concerns that giving steroids after the second vaccine could reduce the effectiveness against COVID, similar to what has been described in immunosuppressed patients where a third shot has been recommended? Yeah, you know, we're studying, um, our ID colleagues are studying their response um, in our solid organ transplant recipients because there's a lot of thought um, and a lot of reports initially out of adults that solid organ transplant recipients, particularly those on CELCEPT, are not making as strong of an antibody response to the vaccine. And that's something we counsel our heart transplant uh, patients on. So, you know, in terms of the steroids, it's hard. Some centers are using um, like their MISC protocols and are using steroids. We're not here. We haven't given any of these cases steroids, and I don't think they really require it. Um, so we're trying to sort of be steroid avoidant. But it, it's, I think it'll be something to come. And I think that there's a lot of research being done around this. Our um, immunology colleagues are also very interested in looking at these cases and trying to understand them further. But I don't think we have any data, but I'd say we just, we try and be steroid avoidant if we can. Great. And then um, Catherine Eftendalian asks about um, that in the oncology population, they've, they've interestingly seen multiple cases of supraclavicular lymphadenopathy after COVID vaccine. And she asks if she should report these cases to VARES. Uh, Grace, you want to take uh, that? Yes, please do. Actually, I have gotten questions from the community. Um, and I'll just say anecdotally, um, we have treated it as if it was the axillary lymphadenopathy. So it tends to be ipsilateral on the same side of the vaccine. Um, if it happens within a short period of time, I usually say sort of one to 10 days post-vaccination and lasting uh, a short time uh, to continue to monitor closely, but not necessarily require biopsies if you have this uh, clear exposure uh, to a very um, immunogenic vaccine. Um, however, that said, I would love to be able to ensure that all those cases are reported into VAERS because I know that it's coming to clinicians and you are stuck with trying to figure out what to do at the bedside with these patients. Um, and really important, if it goes into VAERS, then we can start to see clinical considerations coming up. I have done a query of our CESA system and there's only um, two cases that have come for clinical consultation. So again, more uh, reports means that we'll have more information. Thank you. 
And, and Grace, you, you spoke already a little bit about thinking about vaccinating younger children, but do you have, can you just quickly uh, comment on potential timeline? Um, uh, nothing other than what's reported in the media. I usually only can confirm when I have an emergency ACIP meeting scheduled and on the books, then I know when it's gonna happen. <laughs> so nothing uh, yet. Right. Fair, fair enough. Um, uh, a question about um, masking, that's a, probably a whole nother hour, but um, your advice, uh, maybe that's a great question also, but your advice on, on masking in the Bay Area at this point? Um, so uh, again, I think in the Bay Area, we actually are in a bit of a bubble for multiple reasons, but in this, in this instance, we actually have a highly vaccinated population. However, um, you know, I think that if people uh, I always make it a personal decision. If, if some people are very risk averse and if you want to uh, mask uh, because it makes you feel more comfortable and safer, um, that I think it's a very reasonable thing to do and that we should as a society um, normalize that behavior as uh, reasonable given that people, we don't know anyone's background if they're immunocompromised, if they've been able to respond to the vaccine, if they're caring for someone immunocompromised at home. So I think it's really important to respect those choices uh, for those who are risk averse. Um, and then I think uh, we just have to, I, I personally have been feeling uh, more comfortable, but recognize that with the Delta variant, there are, um, while there have been no severe cases and no deaths that I understand that are associated with vaccinated people, I do believe that uh, there is increased transmissibility and so carriage is possible. So again, vaccination protects us from um, being infected or carrying it asymptomatically. However, it's not perfect, so, I, you know, if you uh, feel compelled to do so, I, I think it's a personal decision. Um, and we'll see what things happen in the fall. Great, well, I think, um, I think we're gonna wrap up. I, I, I apologize that we didn't get to all of the questions. I appreciate everybody submitting these questions and, and just a huge thank you again to all three of you for uh, providing us with your expertise and, and putting so much effort into this talk. We really appreciate it and hope everyone has a great weekend. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.